So welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. And today I am here with one of my fellow EOS implementers, Dan Williams, who's a certified EOS implementer from Independent EQ. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for having me, Deborah. I appreciate oh. the opportunity. Absolute pleasure. Looking forward to hearing your story. So as I said, Dan is actually a certified EOS implementer, but up until 2020, he was actually a business owner himself. And I understand that you started in the business, an IT business at 21 years old as a technician. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I'm a lot um, younger than I look. <laughs> uh, yeah, I started out, it was effectively my first real job, um, starting in a company with, yeah, two or three peers uh, uh, based in Richmond in Melbourne. Okay. And yeah. by the time you sold it in 2020, um, what was the size of the business at that point? Yeah, so it's kind of hard to believe when I reflect on it. So we had, there was two or three of us, uh, I say two or three, we had a bit of a transient workforce at the beginning. <laughs> and we were sort of nudging 100 employees uh, and around 25 million in revenue um, in 2020. Yeah, which when I, wow. when I think about that, it, it sounds like a lot of effort, but it was a lot of fun as well. Okay, so that's that's pretty huge. Growth. So what to what time period was that between when you started and when? Yeah, two thousand two thousand and four. I started uh, in the in the business and as an employee, um, which was a, a novel experience. I haven't been an employee for a long time now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and yeah, exit in twenty twenty. So yeah, sixteen years. Hmm. Yeah. And um, how was it? Uh, it was a mixture of. Um, yeah, of a lot of fun, a lot of learning, and a lot of uncomfortable uh, sleepless nights. <laughs> you know, you know, when I when I reflect on it, there's there were so many things that I I wish that I knew uh, as I was going, and you know, lots of times the the things that kept me awake at night was the responsibility for the livelihoods of the people that we we're employing, and yeah. responsibility for the people and. Uh, I was never really concerned about um, my own abilities. I always trusted myself to get things done. But when you start to be accountable for others, that was, you know, that was always, we seem to be um, along the way attracting some great people. I found that the higher caliber of people that we had around us, that my, my greater, had a greater awareness of how important it was to get things right. Uh, we, yeah. Yeah. But along the way there were, there was, there were so many different things at different ceilings that we hit and I kind of carry them like scars on my back <laughs> these days. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for every opportunity along the way. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? When you talk to businesses, you know, the overnight success isn't quite an overnight success. Um, what would be the biggest sort of challenges that you think that you faced along that journey? I think the biggest challenges were probably inside my own head most of the time. I was pretty insecure about uh, my um, I guess my ability to lead people and to make the right decisions and to have all of the answers and you know I obsessed over having the right people around me and I didn't always get that right so I had some had some failures along the way and in the IT industry quite often businesses are looking to you um, and wanting you to give them assurance that everything is going to be okay, their systems are going to be online, their data is going to be okay. And along the way, some of the challenges were around that, having the right tools and systems and processes in place to be able to actually deliver that to the clients. But then also making sure that we, we were hiring and surrounding ourselves with the right people along the way that you know, perpetuated the brand in the way we wanted to and going from when it's two or three people, it's really easy. You can almost have like the toolbox time at the start of the day and be yeah. on the same page. But as you grow and scale, being able to have consistency of message, consistency of quality, those sorts of things become a real challenge. Uh, and I, I think when I look back on it, it was always my proudest moments came from when people rose to the occasion, and people stepped up and uh, I look at that. I look back into that business now. I have the privilege of being their EOS implementer these days. Yeah, exactly. uh, I look back, you know, it's like my window into the business once every 90 days. And I'm really proud that, that all of those things have continued on uh, in my absence. And that, yeah, I'm really proud of that team. 
That's awesome. So when we talk about business growth, you know, there's the traditional kind of you know, hockey stick growth that they always show you in business. And and I know with my business, it certainly hasn't been that way. It's been a little bit more um, <laughs> mountainous, I think, than just a pure old hockey stick. Would you say yeah. it was similar in your business or how yeah. did it grow? Yeah, definitely. I can almost, um, for some reason, I always remember revenue when I think about ceilings that we hit along the way. And I can remember uh, breaking through like a $2 million revenue ceiling. And it's kind of like we were living out the entrepreneurial myth, you know, that we were a lot of technicians, <laughs> not yeah. a lot of managers or, or, or we didn't identify as visionaries. So we were able to, we would just uh, almost instinctively surround ourselves with more people that we could get more done. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and what happens is we, we, were, we were getting to a point where that was, we were able to churn out greater volume but we weren't strategic. We weren't planning what was happening next. It was kind of like we were laying the runway as we were getting ready to take off. So, and I can remember getting stuck at, at like 2 million and even 5 million in revenue. And I think one of the most painful for some reason was a $10 million revenue ceiling. And so we had some times where we would dip while yeah. we were trying to maybe lay some runway <laughs> or we were trying to prepare for the future. Um, but when we got to a, a, some reason, I think it was around 10 million, we realized that we actually probably needed to take our own development more seriously. And okay. um, even our professional and personal development, human resources is a thing. Not, not a lot of entrepreneurs <laughs> acknowledge that. Yep. Uh, and sometimes we would regress off the back of overcapitalizing on a technology or overcapitalizing on a one key relationship. Uh, so along the way, we got better and better. Uh, and I think layers of leadership are often associated, directly associated with some of those ceilings where suddenly you need uh, a few more people um, at front of house, you know, yep. taking, driving us forward. You know, I always think of the, the um, mental image. I think Vern Harnish came up with the, the genius with a thousand followers. You take the genius out and all you have is followers. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So there was lots of learnings and lots of ceilings, and I can, I love talking to businesses about them now, because the revenue numbers are different, but the ceilings are very similar still to these days. Because it comes, as I said, comes down to growth, doesn't it? And that complexity that comes with growth and whether or not you've still got the right people in the right seats. I'm interested to know, like, as you grew, so you mean you went from three of you up to almost a hundred staff. Um, did the same people stay in the same seats the whole way through or were the changes as the organisation grew? There was, there was a lot of changes and some of the most painful memories when we made the wrong call. So there's always, it was often uh, a, an instinct to elevate people um, because you love them <laughs> and yeah. to give them an opportunity to lead when they're not leaders and they don't want to be. And they often will do it out of obligation to you because you've shown that trust in them. So Mm -hmm. I definitely, as a leader, made that mistake a few times throughout the journey, elevated people when I shouldn't have. And they weren't ready. I wasn't ready. Or they didn't want it. And uh, along the way, we had some great successes bringing some people in from outside. And ironically, the leadership team, as it stands today, the two, two people in pivotal leadership roles don't have an IT or a technology background and when I made that breakthrough uh, discovery um, we hired someone into the business her name's Alana Kane I'll give her a direct plug um, <laughs> love love her to bits she's a she and she she created an opportunity for me to drive the business forward at, as a as a visionary I was a uh, stifled visionary trying to be a general manager and definitely that's, that's definitely not me. Uh, or as we call it, integrator in EOS speak, I'm definitely not an integrator. Like, I know. Opinion. It's definitely <laughs> not me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, along the way, learning those things and understanding that uh, how important it was to not only have the right people, but to have them in the right seat. Yeah. And, you know, quite, you know, I look back on it and had some uncomfortable conversations with people where I was, leading them down a path and I could see it all um, ahead of us. And it's sometimes it's hard to convince people of these things. And if, when trust is high and they trust you and you trust them, um, yeah. you know, these things are possible. Uh, but yeah, I'm grateful that, that I get to meet with that leadership team now and so rewarding to see them, you know, having the right people in the right seat to this day. 
So was the sort of a turning point, something that happened that kind of made things suddenly click? Yeah, so I can, I can give another plug to a person, Daniel Davis. Uh, <laughs> yeah. About six, maybe seven years ago, uh, he introduced me to the entrepreneurial operating system. And he had attended an event overseas and got a copy of Traction by Gino Wickman. And he read it on the flight home. And when he got back, he contacted uh, my business partner and I and said, I've learned about this thing called EOS and you need it in your business. And we trusted him. He's, he's a, anyone who has met him is a lovely in, introverted individual. <laughs> and, he, um, and he gave us what we, what we came to know as the 90 minute meeting and he told us about this operating system. And I was so frustrated. I went through this range of emotions of frustration, embarrassment, all these sorts of things. And realized, I didn't realize there was such a thing as an operating system for a business. Uh, and being a tech person, you associate operating systems with Ma Apple, Mac, yeah. or Windows. IOS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, and he introduced it to us and we started implementing uh, in the business. And that was about nearly seven years ago. And that was a major turning point because suddenly we, we knew whether we had the right people in the right seats or not. And we had a plan that we could unite behind. Um, not being the original founder in that business and coming into a business that is now uh, yeah, nearly 30 years um, old. Um, we were adopting some, somewhat of a legacy and I was creating a new vision for the business at the same time. So we were finally able to unite and then made some key uh, decisions like identifying that I wasn't the person to be the general manager. <laughs> I wasn't integrating and elevating some key people. And having some tough decisions, but bringing, being able to link it back to that vision, and you know, six or seven years later, that business is still running on the on the entrepreneurial operating system, which is hugely okay. satisfying. And you're the uh, the implementer now, aren't you? Yes, I am, and it's great. It's a it's a privilege to to have them in this room <laughs> once every ninety days, where I, I get to uh, I get the reward to reap the rewards of the investment that I made personally into that business. Mm -hmm. And to know that the tools and systems are everlasting and enduring and they, they're going on to this day. And, and quite, I'm quite proud of the fact that they've actually kicked on since I left. So uh, maybe, they, maybe the timing was right for both of us. It's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously when I joined EOS about 18 months ago, um, there was a talk of changing a visionary at EOS. And, and for me, that was kind of like, but, but you can't do that because the visionary is the founder, that's the person who, you know, but it's not true, is it? I mean, that, that as the business grows and changes, you can require different people, even at that top level, right? Yeah, definitely. So I guess now that business has changed visionary three times. So yeah. Pre-EOS, unofficial visionary uh, was the founder, uh, who's one of my business partners, Jacob. And yep. he was never really comfortable. He was more of the, the entrepreneurial myth, the e-myth of the technician and yep. was great at that and really um, tenacious. And I was more of the visionary, big picture thinking, obsessed with learning and development. And he was quite happy to hand that, that hand, pass the torch to me. Yeah. <laughs> and then leaving the business, uh, we, we'd done three or four mergers and acquisitions through the time. And so some of the founders of those businesses stayed on. And so that was a great um, opportunity to, to, for one of them, his name is Nick, to step into that visionary seat as I exited the business. I think it's more about understanding that every business uh, needs a visionary element. And I always see that seat as actually being the one who's accountable for making sure that we're moving forward and for channeling that energy in the business. Yep. Because I think great businesses have lots of visionaries in them, but they don't harness that power for good. <laughs> mm -hmm. They create, you know, the, as Gino describes, that organizational whiplash. Uh, yes. So, yeah, if you can really get someone who's a strong visionary in that seat but has the discipline to take that as an accountability, not as a license to do whatever they please, then it can yeah. be a great thing. Okay. And you've talked about, you know, obviously having the right people in the right seats is really important, but sometimes, you know, you have got 
the elephant in the room, the person who maybe isn't in the right seat. How do you tackle that? What would be your sort of tips or pointers for even thinking about that, let alone dealing with it? Yeah, so uh, we come across this all the time and the way I deal with that has evolved uh, for the better <laughs> over the journey. Yep. I, I always encourage you to try and understand first whether they are the right person. Um, not, that, not to say that I wouldn't bother with the right seat conversation if they're not the right person, but if you are adamant that they are the right person, that they share your values, then I always encourage leaders and I'm talking to myself here as well to be prepared to lean on those values and have a conversation about what is in the best interests of the team and the company and ultimately the individual because no one wants to be in a position that they don't enjoy and that they aren't good at so if you can give people an opportunity to self-identify that perhaps they're in the wrong seat then that's always the, the, the best path to actually remediating. Yep. But if they, if they don't see it, then you need to be the one who goes first. And I love the way we use the GWC acronym. If someone doesn't get it, they don't understand how they contribute and, and what the, the requirements of the seat are. If they don't want it, they, their behavior, the way they, the results perhaps don't demonstrate that they want it and they don't have the capacity for it then it can't feel good for them. So um, giving them that opportunity. It's a lose-lose, lose, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I love the way we can just illustrate that. And I'm work, working with one of my leadership teams recently and I wrote GWC on the whiteboard. And it was a light bulb moment when we actually, we, we sort of dig, dug deep into what that actually meant to be in the right seat. Mm -hmm. Because I know that I've been in the wrong seat lots of times <laughs> and I never put my hand up. Um, people don't, unfortunately. Um, yeah. So you've got to create. Well, I'm not sure that it's normal. I, well, I say normal. It's not like it's accepted practice to kind of go, hey, you know what? I'm actually not happy in what I'm doing. And what I love about the EOS um, way of dealing with it is you actually get a chance to review it on a regular basis and yeah. actually have those conversations. You know, is this really a role that I want? Um, and I've, I've seen, you know, literally senior management team members swap roles once we've gone yeah. through that exercise because yeah. they realise that, in fact, they had a desire and, and the capacity for the other role, not the role they were currently doing. And when do we have those conversations in, in life? You know, by the way, I wouldn't mind doing your job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, spot on. And I can think even through the PowerNet journey, uh, hitting a ceiling uh, of being able to grow and uh, have a, pipe, a healthy pipeline. And yeah. it was because we were asking a sales leader to also be accountable for marketing. And, right. and that what happens is they choose they're going to choose the one that they get or they want more and uh, they're a great salesperson really strong in sales and marketing was suffering mm -hmm. so as soon as we separated the two that actually elevated this person they became a better salesperson a better sales leader and they were able to sort of sigh uh, with relief that marketing was now someone else's accountability and lo and behold, we bring in a subject matter expert there and we actually decided to outsource it, someone to be accountable for that seat, but to outsource it. And suddenly our image in the market improved dramatically. So wow. you, know, you can use those sort of use cases as examples for when you actually elevate someone to their, you know, their natural or their unique abilities. And, and quite often, uh, especially entrepreneurs and business owners and founders find themselves in seats that they don't want but the business needs them and there's no one else. And if we don't keep a check on that, like systematically keep a check on that, then they can become, that can become like a ball and chain for the business on, on a founder or an entrepreneur's ability to fulfill like the finance seat, <laughs> you know, yeah. high risk. You know, when I started independent EQ and I did an accountability chart with all one of me in the business, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I realized the first thing I needed to do was outsource my finance. <laughs> and yep. So, so I, I've done that and still have that to this day. And that was the benefit of 
of experience and knowing that that wasn't my, that didn't align with my abilities. Yeah, yeah it wasn't your really ability. I also think there's an opportunity cost, right? Because if you're doing all that stuff that you're not so great at, then you're not free to do the things where you really, truly add value. But we're so scared to kind of let go of those things. Or as you said, we feel we can't, but in actual fact, it can be really as simple as going, yep, I'm going to outsource that or I'm going to yeah. let somebody else step up and do that. And even if they're only 80% as good as me, that's that's good enough and it gives me the yeah. freedom to do what I love. Yeah. Yeah. I often refer to it when I'm dealing with smaller leadership teams. Some of the leadership teams that I work with are just two people, yeah. uh, like a visionary and the integrator. And it's often a lot of fun dealing with the teams that size. And I, I, I use an example of when I was 18, I used to work in a drive through bottle shop. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. And I was fascinated that they had an, a breakage allowance that they would just accept that sometimes a forklift would drop things or people would drop a bottle, a wine, bottle of wine in the shop. And I thought, wow, they actually allow for breakage. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that was fascinating. They didn't want to make it so things weren't broken. Um, so with business owners, you almost need to accept a little bit of breakage if you want to be free to be your best self. And sometimes 80% in a, in a seat needs to be enough. And that 20% yeah. breakage means that you go on to excel in other areas mm, that's a good analogy i like that okay so obviously you know you did a great job with with what was that, the company sorry power Powernet. Powernet. Yeah, Powernet. Yeah. yeah did a great job with power net um i always ask my my guests you know what was their professional and personal best in their life what would be yours in terms of both professionally and personally yeah so from a personal perspective uh there's, there's lots of lots of things along the way i'm have a lovely wife and beautiful kids <laughs> so they're from a personal perspective it's kind of easy to gravitate to those sorts of achievements which I am eternally grateful for yep when I look at how a uh, major turning point in my life uh, was and a personal great was when I decided that uh, I wanted to be a property owner I didn't want to rent property and yep. it was a lot of my friends were renting and uh, and I, I actually thought I'd prefer to live somewhere where I'm not 100% happy living there, but I was I owned the building that I was in. Yes. And I, I, the, my reasons for justifying that to myself have probably changed over time. But I got into property ownership at a, in my early 20s, which, yes. which has made a lot of entrepreneurial decisions simpler in my life where, you know, I had equity from a young age, so I was able to roll the dice sometimes and take, take risks. Yep. So from a personal perspective, it's, you know, no disrespect to my wife and kids. I love them dearly, great <laughs> personal highlights. But actually taking that plunge when some of my friends would prefer to party and spend all of their income on enjoying themselves. Yep. I decided to spend my income on, on building some personal wealth. Um, and from a professional perspective, you know, it's really the power net story that, you know, getting in there, being prepared to lead, to, to learn, surround myself with the right people, implement an operating system, yep. and then successfully transition out. You know, in 2019, I exited the operation of the business and I really struggled because they were my family as well. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, 2020, I sold out of the business and to see that, I didn't know how I was going to feel about that, but to yep. see that business flourish, flourish and thrive in my absence is absolutely now my professional highlight of my career today. Great. And so now you're obviously working full-time as an EOS implementer, uh, but also yeah. doing a couple of boards. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I've got a couple of things uh, on the go. So EOS is my mainstay and my absolutely my, my purpose aligned activity. Everything else is, is opportunities to give back involved with uh, some board positions uh, and leading a peer group. Uh, and I've recently um, started a business, uh, a third-party logistics business <laughs> with a friend. Oh, really? I wasn't uh, aware of that. Is, okay. <laughs> yeah, which is really exciting. Uh, and it's yeah. skills that I don't have, which is, which is a lot of fun. Uh, my business partner uh, runs it. He's in there. It's, his, it's his, um, his field of expertise and experience. And I'm lending my outside experience to help you know, develop and grow that, which is a lot of fun. Excellent. Um, yeah, and the rest of the time, I'm, uh, I'm scratching that entrepreneurial itch. I'm always looking for opportunities to grow and to do things better and, yeah, exploring. Yep. Yeah. 
Perfect. So we always like to make sure that our listeners have got sort of three top tips they can take away with them around the topic. And today's topic was really around people and getting the right people in the right seats. What would be your three top tips for them, Dan? Yeah, not in any particular order. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I I would say as a a business leader, owner, entrepreneur, my, my first tip would be to invest time in understanding why you do what you do. And, you know, Simon Sinek sort of started the whole start with why movement. Uh, and I think that I, I love his work. And so no disrespect to Simon, but I think if you really dig deep and understand why you do what you do, mm-hmm. then it becomes a lot easier to bring people along. Yeah. And, uh, and, it's, and when it flows naturally then it, and it's authentic, then it's even easier. So invest in understanding why you do what you do. Yep. Um, the, ne- the next one would be kind of helps fuel that is tip two would be to invest in yourself. You're, you're no good to anybody if you're a broken mess, yes. <laughs> especially <laughs> yourself. So yes. you need to, to re- really be deliberate in investing in yourself and that's your health, your you know, physical and mental health, your well-being, um, and your, 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 your organ in your head that is, is going to guide you and make all of this sustainable, your brain, you need to invest in your own development. Yep. And if you, if you don't do those things, then you're, you're placing limits on what you will achieve. Um, yeah. Sure. And also you're limit, limiting your impact. Mm-hmm. Um, the third tip would be to surround yourself with people who will challenge you. Once you know people who are going to encourage you to have different conversations who are going to offer you different opinions to yours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some of my favorite people throughout my journey are those who I didn't actually agree with <laughs> because they encouraged me to expand my thinking. And yeah. as long as you're there, there's no ill intent or malice and your values are aligned, um, you, you, if you surround yourself with people who are going to challenge you, then you're going to grow and ironically tip one and two will start to take care of themselves. Yeah. And otherwise you just end up going back to the beginning of our conversation. You end up being the genius with a thousand followers, right? (laughs) Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Elevate the genius around you is the best way to go. Um, And and if you can, if you can understand why you do what you do and invest in yourself and surround yourself with people who are going to challenge you, you'll have a lot more fun as well. And ultimately, yeah. if you're not enjoying what you do, then that's a call to action you need to change. Completely agree. Fantastic. Hey, Dan, look, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. It's been absolutely awesome. Actually, it's thank the first you. time I've, I've really heard it too, so I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, if somebody you. wants to get in contact with you and wants you to help them out with their business, how would they get in contact with you? The uh, best way is to probably uh, get me on email. So it's dw at independenteq.com.au. Uh, mm-hmm. And I write, I write a blog every Sunday on LinkedIn. Um, yes, I follow which it. Is a, which is which is a lot of fun. So, if you don't want to interact directly with me, you can get some insight into my mind <laughs> once it once a week. Stalking on you online. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'd love to connect and share and and learn together. Yeah, fantastic. Hey, look, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, appreciate have a lovely time. rest of your day. Thank you for coming in on your day off as well. Really appreciate that. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, um, Look forward to seeing you later on. Thank you, Deborah. Good luck. Right, I love thanks, you. Well